I like records you can listen to late, late at night or early in the morning. Those are the two best kinds. That's it, man. Is there somebody you haven't played with that uh, is still on your list? Oh, yeah, man. Who's number one? Bob Dylan is amazing. I mean, he's still alive. I mean, we've lost so many of the greats, you know what I mean? You better hold on. I got tickets for Desert Trip. Oh, yeah, it's so great. And yeah. the Stones are playing so great. Yeah. Not that I want to go play with them, but I love the, the rockers. You know, my dad was a, born in 41. He was a first generation rocker. And he's got a little bit of history with the Stones. Yeah, he did. He played a little on bit wild of history, horses, right? yeah. you know? <laughs> and, uh, but what, my point was be it Dead and Company or Phil Lesher Friends or the Stones or whoever, yeah. I don't begrudge anybody playing their music in whatever lineup they want to. You know what I mean? It's a hard life. And when you start losing members, be it Almond Brothers or Government Mule, yeah. or the you know, it's hard. But the repertoire is what has to be carried on. That has been my biggest realization, is that, because you know, we play roots music from our community, be it my dad, you know, dad and his friends, they weren't hippies, they were beatniks. They were bohemians before the hippies. And they were, you know, rock and rollers turned folkies. Right. And the folkies were song collectors. Like, that was the hippest thing. Who had the most obscure song? But it's the repertoire that has to be carried on. Yeah. Be it R.L. Burnside or my father and his friends. Do you or, feel a responsibility? Yeah. And it's the repertoire. It doesn't matter the stylistic trappings, the production. It could be electronic interpretation. Whatever. Whatever it takes to get yourself off to get to and to trick a new generation into listening to it. Well, is that what it's about? Is it about passing this torch on to the new generation? Yeah, it's about making sure it doesn't die. You know what? So we were a working class band. We work we drove all day to get here, you know, in our van. And we have, and, and we're proud of that and it's awesome. But you know what would be so amazing would be not to, you know, be rich and famous and tour in a luxurious fashion, but to, to inspire people to make rock and roll in the future. Big Star from Memphis. Sure. Those records barely came out. Barely came out. The third record that my dad produced didn't come out, and it was the most influential one. They had tapes, and that's REM, their placements, you know, the whole alternative college. Do you think Big Star has not gotten the credit in history that they deserve? Well, that's the thing. It doesn't matter, because they were influential. Right. And deep down, we're all mortal. Who, who, I mean, you know, you can't beat Jimi Hendrix. I mean, that, he's gonna be the guy 100 years from now. It's still gonna be Hendrix yep. and Jerry. You know what I mean? I mean, what are we actually trying to do here? You know, not be famous or, or be wealthy. It's about the music and carrying it on. And it comes back to, if we can just inspire other people to create and to do that thing. That's, I think right now, I'm 43. That's what I think about. It's almost like a hobby of mine, is keeping up with uh, Jack White and Third Man Records. For real, right? I mean, it's he's such a creator. It's not even about being in a band or anything. He, yeah. just, he opened a storefront and he started a record company and it's just cool. I made, a, I made a record in his booth. You did? Yeah, yeah right? See, me too. <laughs> you know, it's fun. It's, uh, I take my kids there, you know, and it's just, uh, it's a positive yeah. force, you know? It's funny, I've always been protective of what I listen to because I'm easily influenced, yeah. you know? So I, I go through phases of listen to, listening to his music, uh, but I don't, I don't all the time because, uh, like I said, I have to be careful, you know? It's like... So will you not listen to like Dwayne Allman or anything like that? Well, I did. See, I grew up on the uh, Allman Brothers and Jimi Hendrix. Those are my two bands. And my friend, I resisted the Grateful Dead. I resisted, it was funny, like the, the, the kids I would get our drugs from, they were all deadheads, you know, because they, they would go to, go to tour and bring the drugs back. Sure, good I, mean, I benefited. Drugs, I know? benefited a lot from <laughs> their tours in my own way. But, but we would argue about it, because I was live at the film where reissue had just come out. And that literally changed my life, because I was sitting there in my room tripping balls listening to Elizabeth Reed saying, that's what I want to do with my life. My father and I, man, we would sit and talk about art and music and culture. That's all we talked about. And ever since he passed, he passed in 09. Yeah, sure. And I just don't have that no. anymore. His speaker system in the living room with his pot tray on top of it, <laughs> and it vibrates off 
and falls on the floor and the pot falls over and I innocently just jump down and start picking it all up. I didn't even know what it was, but I just sure. remember, I, I mean, just daddy's thing. we still got the tray. And, uh, and I remember someone in the background at the party, you know, the mid seventies were wild. <laughs> Somebody was like, just get the buds. You still have the tray? We still got the tray. It's sitting you, on his piano right now. It's on his piano. Yeah. Does it ever get used? Yeah. Yeah? I mean, it seems like, <laughs> it's like, you know, this one's for dad, right? <laughs> totally, man. He caught me turning. And it was during, while well, I was playing with the Black Crows, I quit, they quit smoking weed for a while. Because you were with the, when you were with the Crows? While I was, yeah, for multiple reasons. It wasn't fun anymore at that point. And I was just, the, the late night bus munchies were uncontrollable. Yeah. It's getting too heavy. I couldn't control it. Derek said something about reefer once it summed it up is sometimes it makes you doubt every note before you play it that's not a good space to be in it's not a good space to be in you gotta yeah. you gotta believe in every note but I, but i've fallen it's you're yeah, back i'm back <laughs> <laughs> like i said i grew up with the allman brothers and Jimi hendrix i love psychedelic improvisational rock and roll of course, like through growing up and my friends, I heard Grateful Dead music, but Chris Robinson on the Black Crows bus really hit me to it. Like he would listen to it constantly. So it really got in my head without even knowing it. Right. But Phil, man, I mean, here's a man in his 70s. He reminds me of Junior Kimber, the way he, Junior Kimber had his juke joint and people would come to him and he would teach musicians how he wanted them to play. You know, and Phil, he doesn't want to tour. He built his place. Yeah. There's an outside venue, there's a ballroom, dance hall venue, there, and there's a restaurant venue. And they have a whole community of young musicians that they encourage and employ. And, and, and the repercussions of that, what they're doing with that is, is going to be long-term repercussions of the San Francisco scene of these musicians. But to play with Phil, man, if you like to go into the zone of improvisational rock and roll, he is on the main line. He goes there faster than anybody I've ever played with. You're just like in there and you look over at him and he's just like, like smiling. Is he an active teacher in a way? I mean, what are you getting Dude, from him? So how, how, what, how amazing a person is this who would hire a musician like me to come pay you well to come into your home and you don't know his music by heart? He'll take the time staying there all day and teach you the, in, the ins and outs and the intricacies of his repertoire. It's amazing. What was what were some of the difficult ones for you? Oh, well, my thing is I can't sing Jerry. Jerry was a tenor, right? And I'm a baritone, and it, he lives right where my voice cracks. And Phil's a baritone too, though. Now, yeah, but. Uh, but uh, the guys who can sing it, man, you know, it's like Jack, I was just playing with Phil and Jackie. And Jackie right. Green, man, ah, this is a wonderful musician. Like I said, I can't sing Jerry. I can sing Pigpen, because that's exactly <laughs> what Dad and his friends did, was that style of, of blue-eyed soul rock and roll. Yeah. And, you know, the, going into the improv raps, you know, like talking shit and whatever. I love that. And as soon as I realized that that's what Pigpen was doing, and he realized that I could do it. We really had a lot of fun. So you went some of the old stuff then, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would have me sing Pigpen. So oh, I like doing nice. that. But Jerry, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know what the hardest thing we did playing with Phil and Friends was we did a tour, and we were in New York and at the Cap, and it was Anders and I. Yeah. And uh, every night we would play a whole classic Southern rock record, be it like Pronounce Leonard Skinner, be it Sticky Fingers, be it uh, Derek and the Dominoes, yeah. be it uh, Everyone Knows This Is Nowhere. Some are easier than others, but that shit was hard because we, we didn't have enough time to rehearse. And Anders and I didn't, nor Phil, none of us knew it by heart. Derek and the Dominoes, I didn't, I don't know that music by heart, how to play it, you know? Even. So, how do you go about doing that then? If you don't, you I mean. Just like, do your best. You do your homework. I mean, Phil's sitting there with headphones, making his charts. Everybody's He's got his iPad it. there. He loves it, man. Uh, but it's funny because you can go on YouTube. You check out Phil Lesh and Friends with Anders and Luther doing Ramblin' Man. And it's a 30-second clip of second verse, and then we blow. Not only do we not <laughs> blow the, the harmony guitar line, neither one of us even play it. It 
was just a <laughs> void. Yeah. You know, we nailed it in rehearsal. How does Phil react when, when that happens? Oh, he like, doesn't, give he doesn't care, yeah. right? But every time I would blow a classic rock lick, I'd be like, oh, oddly Freed knows that by heart. Like, oh, Warren knows that one. Oh, you know, <laughs> like, it's funny. We grew up writing music. We learned our dad's repertoire, which was different, you yeah. know? You know, we would write music. We learned what we were into. And then as professional musicians, we would write and record our own music or people who hired us. So it's like the way we grew up, we don't know a lot of covers. It's funny, like a lot of classic songs that you hear in a rock and roll setting or a jam band setting. Like we did, I love the music, but I never learned it. Yeah. So, you know, you just have to play by ear and follow along the best you can. But we grew up in the studio just like making music, which is cool. But it's awkward when you don't know that Stevie Wonder change. Ah! I got a couple after my dad passed. Yeah, what'd you get? Yeah, I got, they're both uh, Memphis, Memphis inspired uh, images. The country blues festivals in the mid 60s. Yeah. Uh, this guy. So that's a. Uh, it's an angel blowing a trumpet and it says the Memphis sound. It's an ancient. What's that? It's a beetle. It's a scarab from a neon sign in Memphis called the, from a restaurant soul food place called yeah. the Green Beetle. And they're both images my dad loved and I got them after he passed. And that, that's all I ever got. Yeah. I never wanted it a lot. And I don't even know why I got those, but I did. Yeah, because at some point something means a lot to you and you just want to yeah. carry it around with you all the time. Not that you're not carrying it around with you, but... It's an interesting thing. It is. I finally, I just got my first. Wow, right? And Yeah, and it took me a long time. I, it's All it is is it's over here, it's the outline of, I don't know if I can get it out. Oh, yeah. It's the state of Arizona. There it is. This is where I'm from. That's it. And my parents have since moved away. I have no more roots there. And I thought, I don't know, I just, I'm going to put on my skin and carry it with me everywhere. That's a tender spot, too. It wasn't bad. <laughs> I let my daughters bite me, and then I just draw them in with sharpies and take them on the road with me. That's their normal tattoos. You could, that'd be kind of a cool tattoo, actually, to get your daughter's bite marks. Yeah, I almost did it once, but it didn't happen. But no, it'd be a good tattoo. Yeah, it would. So it took your dad passing away for you to get one. It meant something to you. Is there anything that he ever told you? Like, is there a piece of wisdom that he gave you that to this day still sticks out for you? Well, he would say, play every note like it's your last, because one of them will be, you know? And it, at first, that's uh, kind of intimidating, but it shouldn't be. It doesn't mean that every note has to be amazing. It just means do it like you mean it, you know, just like... Be it, deliberate. Yeah, be deliberate, exactly. And recently, I hear in my mind, because I'm always multitasking. Yeah. But sometimes I hear just like, do one thing at a time. One thing at a time. I guess he, Is that something he would say? say? Yeah, yeah. And man, he watched TV constantly. Constantly, later in life. And what he would his, say, he'd be like, you know I'm only doing this to distract myself as I think, you know. He had to justify like, it. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it was true, I'm sure. He was multitasking his own way. And, and then my friends and I were like, yeah, you know, dad watches, you know, they watch TV all the time. Mom's got TV on all day, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, we think we're better than that, but I think we're worse. You well, know, just worse. recently I was like, we haven't evolved from this. This has just become... And we're doing it in eight-hour blocks. It's crazy. Because you can't get away from it. And that's what's hard for my kid, like, to get the, that iPod away from her. Because I know how addictive binging is. Yeah. And if you can, you know, it's not like we could watch Sesame Street once a day. And then something else came on you didn't care about. But to watch, if you could get to watch the beat bugs all day, every day. Speaking of which, the beat bugs, if you got kids... Check out the beat bugs. Beat bugs, all right. Based on the Beatles. I just finished the Marin okay. IFC show. Which is like that last season it's blew brilliant. my mind. I just like the, the life, the alternate reality that he created for himself. Like he is a recovering addict and you, you know, that's a day-to-day -day thing. Right. But he indulged himself in this fantasy he let himself go there. Yeah, he went to a place where he hopefully he doesn't there. want to go again. Yeah, and he's like on Charlie Rosie said, I'm glad it was a fictional yeah. guy. Yeah, you know, I'm glad it was a fictional me and that me. For real. So your guilty pleasure is you're watching a lot of TV. You're binging on it when you're home. Not when I'm home. Not when you're I home? I don't, because that's the thing. It's such a thing. I mean, if you do three to four or five, I mean, I do a lot of traveling. A yeah. lot of traveling. It affects. You fall asleep, you wake up, you dream about it. And you know, my wife and I noticed while we were watching Mad Men that you, know, you talk about those characters like they're your friends, like you, you and your wife. You're like, yeah, I can't believe she did that. Yeah. I told you bitch was crazy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh yeah, man.